Thanks very much. Um, in addition, to, I very much appreciate the invitation today to speak. And in addition to switching gears to something benign, it's also switching gears to potentially something that not many people do. And I, I'm just going to start out so I, I put in a little more slides than I may need, and I may skip a few. Depends. How many people here do reoperative J-pouch surgery? Just out of curiosity. Don't be embarrassed if you don't. But small number, so okay, that's kind of what I, what I suspected. For this talk, I have no relevant disclosures. I wish somebody made something that made this surgery easier, but thus far I've not found it. So none of the ones I have I thought were disclosures. The book lists all the ones that are not relevant to this talk. Um, why do we, uh, these are the things I'm gonna talk about, why we have failures in pouches, uh, what are some of those factors, how we manage them, some technical tips. What is the failure rate for pouches? It varies anywhere from low single digits to a high that's in the mid-teens, depending on who you read around the world. One thing we do know is that is there's a very steep learning curve. And when you start performing pouch surgery, your failure rate will be higher than when you're well on in your career and performing uh, several pouches every week. The reasons why pouch fails, regardless of what point in your career you might be, could be fistulae. Maybe it's really Crohn's disease, or maybe a technical problem caused a fistula. Maybe there's a residual sinus, perhaps a stricture. Uh, occasionally, it could be something as innocuous as, as adhesions causing something not very innocuous, like, like gangrene. You can have pouch prolapse. It's really rare, but you can have it or the sphincter could be damaged. The most common thing we would see is something like sepsis, and I'll, I'll get into that. You also can see dysplasia, particularly in the retained anal transitional zone, and the way double-stapled pouches are now done, particularly laparoscopically, in the retained rectum, and often what we see is a pouch rectal anastomosis, more so than a pouch anal anastomosis. You can have adenomas and cancers forming in this residual colonic mucosa between the pouch and the uh, external um, hemorrhoids. Pouch failure can be because of pouchitis, although fairly uncommon. Cuffitis, much more common. Cuffitis is a moniker, a pseudonym, for retained rectal mucosa, and this really is a, a significant reason. Uh, all the others less common. Efferent limb syndrome can occur from a very long efferent limb left behind, behind and that limb also can fistulize. And, and more than a couple of times, people have come in where they have a, a leak, but it's at the tip of the efferent limb. That is something you can often tackle laparoscopically because you just need to resect the efferent limb. Um, anastomotic dehiscence is a biggie, and we all know that a tension is, is the worst enemy of a pouch anal anastomosis. But there can be other problems too, a pouch that's too large, too small, a twisted pouch, all of these things can occur. So how do we tease all of it out? The patient comes in to see us, you know, basic history and examination. The number one thing on the list has to be to exclude Crohn's disease, and the number two thing has to be to, exclude, to figure out if there's any sepsis involved. Some of these things are a little bit different than you might do for other operations. You've got to look at the pathology slides again be sure it wasn't Crohn's disease. I mean, again, this is repetitive, but it's very important to be repetitive. Does the patient have poor sphincter tone? Maybe you're not gonna do a redo pouch at all because they're going to be floridly incontinent and perhaps they are as a baseline, that's important. Sperm banking for male patients before you do a re-op pouch, very important, probably the same for what John was talking about for current rectal cancer also. If you're gonna be digging something that's fibrotic out from under the seminal vesicles and prostate and over the sacral promontory in a male, they want to know to bank sperm if they have any intent of having kids again later. How do you look at the pouch itself? You look inside, in the office if you can, if there's a stricture, if they're tender, you're going to do intraoperative pouchoscopy. In addition, you image every way you can, including, I find to be a value, MRI or occasionally even a bone scan if you're worried about osteomyelitis from a chronic presacral leak, chronic presacral abscess and some of the things on the slide to help exclude Crohn's disease. Check out the sphincters. Is this patient going to tolerate a revision which will undoubtedly include a transanal completion mucosectomy and a hand-sewn pouch anal anastomosis? You want to know the status of the anal sphincters and the various ways that they can be quantified. Now, as I say, pouchitis is not generally the reason for failure. And you can see the number of pouches that failed because of pouchitis in this series, and it's from a low of one out of 134 to a high of four out of 25 or seven out of 58. So it, it's not the majority reason, but it can happen. If it fails for pouchitis, 
in general, the patient's not going to do well with a second pouch because they're going to get pouchitis again. They may do well with just loop ileostomy diversion and letting it calm down. They probably also won't do well with a continent ileostomy. Um, that was supposed to not be here. Okay, so pouchoscopy. But the problem when you look in a patient like that for pouchoscopy, be sure you're looking in the pouch because very often you look in, it's inflamed, you keep looking, and suddenly everything above it is nice because the pouch was anastomosed to diseased rectum. So surgery is generally the, the last resort. Again, you want to make sure they don't have Crohn's disease, and you want to make sure it's the pouch that's inflamed. That may sound intuitive, but the gastroenterologist sends the patient saying it's pouchitis, and it's a perfectly normal pouch, and there's a five centimeter rectal cuff, and it's really a cuffitis, but again, that's a misnomer. It's really diseased residual rectum. And you can see here in this uh, series from, from Maine campus, Cleveland Clinic, 178 patients with non-mucosectomy pouches over 10 years, dysplasia 4.5%, and this can be a problem in the area of the retained mucosa. So you've got to look at these patients. You may need to strip out that mucosa with doing a pouch advancement for either inflammation, dysplasia, or cancer. The pouch itself can give functional problems, and there's something that some of the GI guys, like Bo Shen, again at Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, calls the irritable pouch syndrome, where they have symptoms that are like pouchitis, but yet when you do your biopsies, the pouch isn't terribly inflamed. Even when you look inside, it's not terribly inflamed. And some patients do get these problems, just like irritable bowel syndrome, they get irritable pouch syndrome. Crohn's disease, of course, the thing I've mentioned several times, Patients who get inflammatory or fibrostenotic or fistulizing are all at risk for uh, losing the pouch. You can see some of the differences here. The in inflammatory changes tend to affect the efferent limb, the fibrostenotic, the afferent limb, and the cuff, and the fistulizing tend to be in, in, in younger patients. So you have three different subtypes, all of which can cause pouch problems. I think the ones that we tend to see the most often are the leaks, you can see on the left-hand part of the slide um, a little posterior sinus leak. You can see a cavity behind the pouch, fairly common. Pouch vaginal fistulas leaks out the efferent limb, uh, as shown here. Anything that can leak will leak in a pouch patient, given you do enough pouches or sent enough pouches. Anywhere there's a staple line can leak, and you've got to evaluate all of it endoscopically and uh, with imaging techniques. Here's a 1,424 pouches, 9% leaked, 16% were from the pouch, but 84% of the leaks were from the ileoanal anastomosis itself. And you can see what the original procedures were. How are these pouch leaks treated? Well, most of them do okay if you aggressively treat them, but often requiring multiple stages. And I'll get to some of the results momentarily. You've got to be aggressive with the patient if the patient is going to pursue this, they have to understand it may be multiple operations. And you can see the healing is pretty good if you really pursue it and the patient is willing to be persistent. So things from like observation, which for a little sinus like the one I showed on the left-hand side, that may heal with just observation, curatage, fibrin glue, but something like the, the large leak with the abscess isn't going to do well with any of the non-operative means. That's going to ultimately need some type of a revision, reconstruction, or excision, and, when, and the algorithm, if the patient wants to retain their pouch, is exactly that. We'll try and revise the pouch you have. If not, we'll try and make a new one, and if we can't make a new one reach, then it's going to be uh, excised. You may be able to revise by making it, it shorter. You may be able to re redo it, or it may end up being, if you really can't get in the pelvis, just a loop ileostomy. Why would you not try and salvage a pouch? The patient doesn't want it. They're tired of it. They're, they're uh, not a very fit patient very elderly, whatever the reason is, the patient can help you with this, but also outcome related. When you get in there and you dig the pouch out of the pelvis and find that the outlet is, you know, about three centimeters diameter and fibrotic after everything is removed, you could make the most beautiful second pouch in the world. But when you anastomose the anus, it is never going to distend and never going to give the patient good function. And you may tell them, if that's the scenario intra-op, it's just not worth doing this because you're not going to have good function. You may not even be able to get in the pelvis. This can happen because of a mesenteric desmoid and an FAP patient or a, a frozen pelvis. So what are some of the results of managing these, these so-called failed pouches? 131 patients, um, salvage surgery was, was able to be done in, in most of them. 
uh, a mix of minor procedures and major procedures. The success rate's higher on the minor procedures. Why? Not because the minor procedures are superior to the major procedures, but somebody who has a manifestation of pouch failure, which is an anorectal manifestation, which can be treated with something minor, like curatage and fibrin glue, has a less severe problem than somebody who has, for example, a large leak out the back of the pouch with osteomyelitis who requires major surgery. It's not the operations are better, it's just that the problems are less complex. Paris Tekis looked at this, uh, at his results of 112 patients, strictly abdominal salvage surgery. Uh, ultimately, median follow-up of about four years showed 21% failure. All of the Crohn's patients who had revised pouches failed. Successful salvage, you can see, was better for non-septic indications than for septic indications. So some of the minor procedures, as I mentioned, patients may do okay with these, but they're going to be lesser problems that are potentially responsive. The major procedures, you've got to take the pouch out and redo it or put a muscle in or something else like that. If it's an anorectal procedure, go prone jackknife, make sure you've got a good headlight, make sure you've got some type of a good retractor, variety of anoscopes to do this. You can really access it and see it. If you're doing an abdominal approach, it's going to be abdominal, perineal combined. Make sure it's that all of these things are adhered to. You've got to be prepared to do everything on that list. You've got to get all the sepsis out, all of the scarring out. The patient must be diverted. By the time you're doing an abdominal perineal redo pouch, they're going to need some type of diversion. Some of the challenges getting the ileum into the pelvis, you can do lengthening maneuvers, either dividing the intermediate arcade with transillumination, scoring the peritoneum is fairly simple, and if the uh, ileocolic vessel wasn't taken to begin with, you can take that. People have described, I've not done it, you know, proximal superior mesenteric maneuvers, but I think that is really something that's more illustrated and spoken about than done. I think scoring over it is one thing, dividing it as a horse of a different color, probably a very dark and not so appealing color. Um, length of the uh, cuff, you're going to be eliminating the cuff. When you reoperate on these patients, you're getting down and doing a, a hand-sewn anastomosis. So it, what the illustration looks like, you know, you've got a patient here with a postanal sinus and residual rectal mucosa here. All of that has to go out. You've got to curette the pelvis, and you may be able to put the pouch back with a hand-sewn anastomosis with a loop ileostomy, but you may be doing a completely new pouch. Make sure you've got good retractors, the patient is in lithotomy, first case of the day, headlight, ureteric catheters, all the same things we just heard about with recurrent rectal cancer. These can be very treacherous pelvic dissections. You've got to be ready to do it. Once you uh, have a leak and you maybe you're thinking it's a small leak, you correct it, you watch it, if it doesn't heal, sometimes diversion will work in those patients. Efferent limb leak is really the only thing that I think you can almost always reproach laparoscopically. Some of the other problems you can occasionally get laparoscopically, but this one is pretty much always, especially if the pouch was done laparoscopic the first time, you can go in and restaple closer to the pouch. Start with an exam under anesthesia. There may be some role for posterior leak to put in an endo sponge. There are some case reports now after um, uh, pouch leaks using for early anastomotic leaks, but ultimately, what we're talking about are these major abdominoperineal salvage operations. What are the results here? You can see good results in about two-thirds of cases in most of the series. Um, again, I'm gonna, I think I said that already, and I want to run out of time here and hear the gong ringing. Um, all of these things are important. The pouch has to be detached. Again, length in the mesentery is necessary. These are some of our results, 59 patients undergoing reoperative pouch surgery. You can see the demographics. Our definition of success was an intact functioning pouch with resolution of the problem at least six months with the stoma having been taken down. Like Paris Tekis series, we did a bit better with the anal procedures than the abdominal procedures because the problems are more minor, and we did better in non-Crohn's and Crohn's and in non-sepsis than in, in sepsis, but very similar to Paris Tekis, 2.2 procedures per patient mean. We were 2.1 patients, uh, 2.1 procedures per patient as a mean. If you have a failed pouch, you're doing an abdominal uh, perineal approach, uh, the, uh, my, my colleagues in the department in Ohio looked at the question of whether it's better to take the pouch out 
or leave it in with a permanent ileostomy. You can't excavate that pouch. You, you know, it, it's difficult, but should you proceed and do it? 136 patients with failed pouches, uh, looking at quality of life data on 74 of those patients, and you can see with a loop ileostomy, patients did not do as well as if you could actually get the pouch out, which is why my algorithm is good outcomes almost got it, good outcomes in selected, well-motivated patients. Smaller perineal procedures work quite well if there are smaller problems. If you've got to go abdominal perineal in these patients, the algorithm is you try to, to salvage the pouch in situ if possible. If not, it has to come out in its entirety with the remaining rectal mucosa. All the debris has to be cleaned out, and then you've got to do a hand-sewn anastomosis with loop ileostomy. If you can't get that pouch salvaged, you make a new one. If a new one won't reach, it's going to be an end ileostomy. Leaving the pouch in with, an end loop with a loop ileostomy is probably not a grand idea. Thank you very much.